The theme for this year's 229th Convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut is the way of Jesus growing in God's mission. The way of Jesus growing in God's mission. Some of you might recall that the issue of growth arose in last year's convention when we began to confront the reality of numerical and economic decline across our diocese. It was suggested that growth might be a possible theme for this year's convention. As your convention planning committee prayerfully planned for this convention, our understanding of growth slowly shifted from a focus on strictly numerical and economic indicators to the broader invitation to grow in faithfulness to the mission of God. It was the planning committee's position, one with which I wholeheartedly agree, that as we become more faithful to what God is up to in the world, the mission of God, then the church, as the body of Christ, will become even more vital and alive. Numerical and economic growth is thus not a goal, but a result. The result of the body of Christ becoming even more faithful to God's mission of restoration and reconciliation in the world. So of course, the question is, how do we become even more faithful to the mission of God in the world? Well, my sisters and brothers, the answer is Jesus. In Jesus, we are given the way and the truth and the life. In Jesus, God has broken down the walls that divide us one from another and restored us to unity with God and each other. In Jesus, God has reconciled the world to himself and given us all the ministry of reconciliation. The way of Jesus is the way of God's mission of restoration and reconciliation. Following the way of Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will indeed grow in God's mission. So the theme of this 229th convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut is the way of Jesus growing in God's mission. In this address, in our Bible study to follow, in our worship, particularly in the sermon that will be given by my good friend and brother, Bishop Michael Curry, I know he will preach the way of Jesus, in our breakout sessions and in our business together, we will be invited over and over to consider what is the way of Jesus. And how are we called through the power of the Holy Spirit to become ever more faithful to what God is up to in the world as we follow the way of Jesus? Now, as I consider the way of Jesus, one constant I see, and that is the reality of change. In Jesus... God is forever doing something new, forever calling us forward into greater wholeness and possibility. Think about it. When God became human in Jesus, it was an entirely new thing. In the incarnation of Jesus, fully human and fully divine, God changed reality and brought about a new creation. In Jesus' life and ministry, God uniquely and decisively changed the way that humans can come into relationship with our loving Creator. 
and in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, God even changed the finitude of death by bringing about life everlasting. In Jesus, God changed and changes everything. Now the apostles and the disciples knew that the way of Jesus was a way of change. They left their nets, their vocations, their families to follow Christ. Like Paul, who was literally and figuratively knocked off his high horse, the disciples were converted, changed from the old ways into the new ways of the love of God in Christ. The way of Jesus, my sisters and brothers, is the way of dying to our old selves and rising to new life in Him. Each and every one of us is invited to change as we follow the way of Jesus. In the waters of baptism, we are buried with Christ in His death, we share in His resurrection, and we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. The way of Jesus is the way of change. The way of Jesus is the way of growing in God's mission of restoration and reconciliation. We Episcopalians in the Diocese of Connecticut, following the way of Jesus, have been embracing change for some time now. Four years ago yesterday, you elected me, a stranger from the faraway land of Massachusetts, <laughs> as your 15th Bishop Diocesan. In the diocesan profile for the election, you stated, and I quote, we sense a strong desire to be open to the Holy Spirit in a new way. We want our next bishop to be someone who can take from our rich history and culture and can also help us to be more open to breaking out of entrenched habits and customs. That's what you said. I dare say that the Diocese of Connecticut, all 168 Eucharistic communities, have been embracing change for some time now, long before I ever arrived here, as we sought and seek to follow the way of Jesus. Now, not all change is easy. And sometimes the precipitating causes of change are not even of God. And in fact, in fact might be absolutely contrary to the love and life of God in Jesus. Last December 14th, the shooting of 20 grade school children and six teachers and administrators at Sandy Hook Elementary School radically changed all of us. In Newtown, we witnessed and experienced the incredible horror of gun violence in new ways gun violence that sadly is not unknown to many who live in our inner cities where shootings of young people are an all too often occurrence. In the hours and days and weeks and months that followed the tragedy in Newtown, we, the people of Connecticut and the people of, our, of this diocese, were changed. And here I want to acknowledge the incredible leadership of the Reverend Kathy Adams Shepherd, Rector of Trinity Church Newtown, and the Reverend Mark Moore, missional priest at St. John's and Sandy Hook, as well as the faithfulness of those two parishes during this time of change, and as we struggled to find the light and life of Christ in the face of such horrendous death and destruction. And out of Sandy Hook, as we were changed, we did begin to find a new voice, a new sense of urgency in challenging the violence, particularly the gun violence endemic in our society. In new efforts of advocacy, in our way of the cross witness in Washington DC on Monday of Holy Week, and 
I commend that photo on the cover of Cruxt magazine that really points to what we were witnessing to when we were together in Washington. And also in ways that we continue to learn how to stand with those who continue to lose loved ones from gu gun violence, particularly in our cities. We are being changed. We are being invited ever more deeply into God's mission of restoration and reconciliation. Thanks be to God. So God can and does bless change. I mentioned in my convention address last year that our four main instruments of being together as the diocese in our leadership councils, namely the bishops and diocesan executive council, up until we vote the new uh, constitution and canons, currently known as BDEC, the standing committee, the commission on ministry, and donations and bequests would try on meeting together as one body in order to better serve God's mission. I believe that experiment has gone well, and we are slowly discerning how we, as leaders of our diocese, can be more fully empowered as leaders together. Last September, this leadership gathering of the four main councils and commissions of our diocese participated in what is known as a SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this analysis was led by the Reverend Gay Jennings, a gifted facilitator who knows our diocese and is also, by the way, the president of the House of Deputies of the General Convention of the Episcopal Church. I am pleased to say that the results from the SWOT analysis that Gay put together reflected that in the opinion of our diocesan leaders, our primary strength is, quote, openness to change. Our main weakness is, quote, broken deanery systems. We have a great opportunity to right now, quote, restructure based upon radically new ideas and possibilities. And the biggest threat is, quote, not changing or changing too slowly. Now, does that sound like Connecticut of old? The land of steady habits? I don't think so. For God has indeed blessed our diocese with leaders on the Executive Council, the Standing Committee, the Commission on Ministry, and donations and requests who are open to the way of Jesus, the way of change. And now I'd like to take a moment and note some other of the changes that these leaders, working in conjunction with your diocesan staff, have been able to affect over the last year or so. At our 2011 Diocesan Convention, we passed resolution number one on mutual responsibility and interdependence in the body of Christ. The intent of this resolution, I believe, was to help our parishes in our diocese become increasingly mutually accountable one to another, particularly through our participation in our common budget that we pass at each convention. Unfortunately, the impact of this resolution in some quadrants was fear and anger. And please excuse this violent metaphor that I'm gonna use, but I've heard some in our diocese say that they thought the resolution called for, quote, hit squads of the bishop who would come close parishes if they were not pledging at 10%. This could not be further from the truth. Rather, in the response to the mutual, mutual responsibility and interdependence resolution, and with the leadership from the Office of the Canon for Mission Collaboration and Congregational Life, Audrey Scanlon, and an incredible team of dedicated volunteers from across our diocese. They've hosted 13 different parishes 
in three collaborative day-long workshops, wor workshops and retreat, as together they sought how they could support each other to live into the parameters of the resolution. As a result of these collaborative workshops and other efforts by diocesan leadership, over the last two years, 34 of the 75 parishes who were previously pledging under 10% of their income to our common work have come up to the 10% level. And average pledges to our common budget passed by the convention have increased from 9.2% to 10% over the past, over the same time period. This is an incredible change. Thanks be to God. We are beginning to change our understanding of what it means to be our diocese. And we are beginning to be increasingly more mutually accountable and responsible one to another in that process. Over the last year, we have also experienced significant changes in how our lay and ordained leaders are supported as together we walk the way of Jesus. On April 20th, 2013, we tried a new thing. We initiated spring training. And too bad about last night, I'm sorry for the <laughs> Bow Sox. <laughs> Couldn't help. But we had our own spring training, and close to 200 leaders from parishes across our diocese, primarily lay people, gathered to participate in 19 different workshops and training opportunities, helping parishes to be more effective and responsible to God's mission, following the way of Jesus. This educational day was so well received that we'll have another spring training event for parish leaders on May 3rd next year at East Catholic High School in Manchester, and you all are invited. In a similar way, your bishops have started wardens and bishops dinners where the three of us meet with wardens from a variety of parishes to eat together and discuss our common life and service in the mission of God. So far, we have had five dinners with close to 100 participants, and perhaps a third of our parishes have participated. Now, speaking of bishops, I want to take a moment to recognize and give thanks for the ministry witness and collegiality of our Bishop Suffragans, the Right Reverend James E. Curry and the Right Reverend Laura J. Ahrens. Bishops Laura and Jim are two of the finest, most gifted, most faithful, and hardest working bishops in the Episcopal Church. We are so blessed by Jim and Laura. Together, the three of us have tried to model one office of the episcopate inhabited by three different bishops, one diocesan and two suffragan. This is meant to change in how we in the Diocese of Connecticut understand the nature and shape of the episcopate. I'm so appreciative how together all of us in the Diocese of Connecticut are reimagining how the office of the episcopate inhabited by Jim, Laura, and I, together, can foster and support this diocese in God's mission. I thank God, and I thank you, Laura and Jim, for our common ministry as bishops. I could not do this job at this point in time without Laura and Jim. Thank you. ways by which we have made changes in our diocesan life and leadership as we seek to be more faithful to the way of Jesus in our service of God's mission. In late 2012, we undertook a nationwide search to find a new canon for mission leadership, resulting in Tim Hodap joining our staff from the staff of the Episcopal Church in Minnesota. Tim is profoundly committed to the mission of God 
and is a gifted communicator and administrator. He, his staff, and parish consultants have reoriented our clergy transition process from focusing primarily on searching for a rector to using that in-between time as an opportunity for parishes to grow in God's mission. And with their good efforts, 41 new letters of agreement between parishes and rectors, assistants, priests in charge, interims, and missional priests have been signed since our last convention. That's a lot of change in our parishes. One of the parishes of our diocese that has come through a time of change in its ordained leadership and its community life over the last year has been our cathedral, Christ Church Cathedral in Hartford. This fall, the Spanish-speaking parish of St. James in Hartford chose to become fully incorporated into the life of the cathedral, making the cathedral a bilingual worshiping community. I'm delighted to say that the Reverend Miguelina Howell, Lena, previously of the Dominican Republic and most recently of the Diocese of Newark, and I have to say one of the most vibrant and dynamic and young Spanish-speaking priests in the Episcopal Church, has come to the cathedral as our vicar, serving the Spanish and English congregations together. Along with Harlan Dalton, as our now regularized priest in charge, the cathedral community and our whole diocese will now have to move forward to answer two important questions. How can Christ Church Cathedral be even more faithful to God's mission, specifically in the city of Hartford? And then secondly, and this is for all of us, what is the vocation of a cathedral in our Diocese of Connecticut as we move forward in the 21st century? These are exciting questions for the cathedral and for all of us to engage as we seek to follow the way of Jesus in that place and across our diocese. Significant changes have also occurred among our staff and activities at Diocesan House. As some of you might recall, in July of 2011, we had a significant reduction of six staff positions combined with two retirements, including, of course, the retirement of Jack Spaeth. These departures represented a 30% decline in staff numbers and the loss of close to 130 years of experience and knowledge. For the first year and a half since July 2011, those who were left at diocesan house had to work mightily just to figure out which end was up while at the same time trying to keep business going as best we could. It was an incredibly difficult time for all. And here I want to thank all the staff at Diocesan House who tirelessly and often at great cost to themselves hung in there during this time of change. I want to note in particular Cindy Winslow who stepped in to assume the responsibility of Canon for Mission Finance and Operations during this time of change. In 2014, Cindy will return to her former position of controller. And with the input of an outside consultant, we expect to search for a new canon for mission operations and finance and completely rebuild our finance department. I wonder if we can pause and just give the staff of Diocesan House here tonight, including our secretaries, a round of applause for their incredible faithfulness and hard work through the years and all that they've done to make this day happen too. Can we do that please?
Thank you. Thank you. So over the last year, we've begun to discern with all of their hard work, some semblance of order in the staff and offices at Diocesan House. Robin Hamiel Urban, our Canon for Mission Integrity and Training, along with a dedicated and gifted group of human resource professionals from across our diocese, literally, literally rewrote our diocesan human resource manual that actually had not been significantly updated since 1998. The new manual, and I know this isn't glamorous work, but it's so important in our life of change. The new manual, authorized by BDEC at their last meeting, is an incredible resource for our whole diocese and puts in place a new, transparent, and just system of appointment, supervision, evaluation, and accountability for staff at all levels. I commend the manual to you and to all of our parishes as a model as you think about human resource matters. And you can find it on the website. Similarly, under the leadership of our Canon for Mission Communication and Media, Karen Hamilton, who of course brought us crux, and I want to remind you, please do make sure, if you can, take home those boxes of crux to be distributed in your own parishes. So with Karen, we are in the process of building a whole new diocesan website with much better search functions, as well with volunteers from across our diocese initiating a diocesan-wide branding effort so that we can better communicate to the world what it means to follow the way of Jesus. The fruits of Karen's efforts will help all of us to use 21st century media to better communicate what it means to follow the way of Jesus. By the way, Adam, what are they saying so far on Twitter? Okay? Okay, good. <laughs> Just wanted to check. <laughs> Finally, at our 227th Diocesan Convention in 2011, we passed unanimously, as much as I can remember, Resolution 12 authorizing the Bishop and Diocesan Executive Council to relocate Diocesan House in order to fit current and future, quote, this is from the resolution, fit current and future staff size as to space, flexibility, safety, ADA standards for accessible design, adequate parking, and ease of transportation access. A dedicated project team of BDEC, augmented by staff and other volunteers from across our diocese, have worked incredibly hard over the last two years, two years, to fulfill this resolution. I'm happy to announce tonight that because of their good efforts, we have recently entered into an agreement to sell the existing diocesan house located at 1335 Asylum Ave in Hartford. In the first quarter of 2014, we expect to move out of the gracious mansion given by Miss Mabel Johnson to our diocese <coughs> during the episcopate of Bishop Walter Henry Gray, dare I say, 60 years ago this year and into new diocesan offices and space. Now the diocesan house relocation project team has thus been actively engaged in helping to find new offices to serve all of us as the diocese. A diocesan-wide poll completed in June 2012 with 263 responses from Episcopalians in 104 different towns and cities showed that our next diocesan office needed to be accessible, close to major highways, centrally located with a state-of-the-art communication and office facility, and have plenty of free parking. <laughs> I'm excited to report that we are in the final stages of formalizing a lease for a new diocesan office space in a redeveloped ball bearing factory at 290 Pratt Street in Meriden, Connecticut.
The new space is fully accessible, right off Highway I-691 at exit 8, with an abundance of free parking, and located, believe it or not, in the geographic center of the population of our diocese. The annual operating costs of the new space will be approximately that of the existing diocesan house, except that we will have much more workable and appropriate office space with reduced capital costs related to ownership, and our building in Hartford will have been turned into liquid assets. Two dedicated laymen of our diocese are facilitating the move to our new diocesan offices. Mr. P Peter Holland from St. Albans in Simsbury as our relocation consultant, and Mr. Duo Dickinson from Trinity on the Green in New Haven as our architect. I see Duo over here. Duo, could you please stand? The plan for our new space is that it will accommodate our diocesan offices, gatherings, and meetings in a state-of-the-art facility that belongs to all of us and is open and is flexible. See, this is the loft. This is an open space. I believe that moving from a mansion in the west end of Hartford to a former factory in Meriden is indeed iconic of the changes that God is bringing about in our life as the Diocese of Connecticut as we move forward into the 21st century. Duo will be here, it's another shot of the space, Duo will be here during the break and we have some very initial drawings that are under that sheet out there. If you want to talk with Duo, we'll see those drawings for the rest of today and for the rest of the convention. My sisters and brothers in Christ, I pray, I pray that all that we do in this 229th convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut will draw us deeper, deeper into the way of Jesus, that way of change, and help us to grow in faithfulness to God's mission of restoration and reconciliation in the world. Thank you.